This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are live here in the studio. It's been a while since I've been back in the studio. I've been doing a lot of uh, travel here most recently, but uh, great to be back here. Uh, we still produce a show for every week, so you can listen to it uh, here at BizTalk Radio, which streams our show uh, out to 30 live radio stations across the country, and the podcast comes out each and every Tuesday. So this week's topic, we're going to talk about design specifically in the role of kind of this convergence of innovation and design. Um, if you think back historically, you'll think about design as kind of a separate thing. Uh, from innovation. Um, if you read my book, you've been a long time listener to the show, you know that I have a strong belief that you can't separate innovation from design. They have to be one and the same. And I'm actually a firm believer that you should actually move that design thinking, design um, engagement right up front because it allows you to bring that human component into understanding the unspoken needs and the unspoken wants of your customers. So today, that's what our topic is. That's what we're gonna talk about. And I've got a great guest that's gonna join us here. So let me bring, go ahead and bring our uh, guest in. So today's guest is Gordon Stannis. He's Director of Design and Strategy at, at uh, Twistthink. Now, you may not know Twistthink, but they work and provide consulting design innovation services to a large number of companies. but. Previously, Gordon led senior design positions at Herman Miller, um, at uh, BMW Group, Johnson Controls. Interestingly enough, all companies that I engaged with when I was at HP, particularly around accessibility, we did a lot of work with Herman Miller around office space designs for uh, accessibility technologies, which also reported to me at one point at HP. So, Gordon, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule on a Sunday to uh, spend with us here at the show. You're, you're welcome, it's my pleasure. So Gordon, talk us a little bit about your background. You've had a pretty wide experience working from everything from you know, office space design to industrial controls to IoT to um, all kinds of things. So give us a little background. Were you always someone interested in design even when you were a kid or how did you, how did you fa fall into this kind of uh, career path for yourself? Um, as a kid, I had a sister who was a graphic designer, so I was surrounded with um, the tools of her trade, and she was partnered with a photographer, so I was kind of sensitive to what he did for a living and kind of hung out in the studio and hung out at Cranbrook Art Academy, which was very near my home. So that was just sort of always in the ether, but I was more of a science guy. I was more interested in like traditional science and I was chasing butterflies through fields and digging up <laughs> tadpoles out of ponds and stuff. But oh, and scaring, you know, not, and scaring your sister, yeah. I'm guessing. Well, it's funny. I have teenage daughters and today I was teaching one how to use a butterfly net for a science class. So I was having a flashback. Um, <laughs> but more than anything else, I was just always curious. And, you know, you read through some places that I worked and I worked at each of those for, for many years, and they were all incredible experiences. But the, the one experience I think that might be the most valuable for people to hear is when I decided to take a sabbatical after only working in industry for four years. And I did it based on a deep sense of, of uh, curiosity. And I, I recognized that I had started my career with a, a brain that was only half bathed in uh, rich nutrients. So I, uh, I took a nine month sabbatical. I rode my bike around the country and that was exactly what the doctor ordered for me personally. I'm not saying everybody needs to do that, but it was, uh, an incredibly eye opening experience. I felt like a politician. I was getting to know my country. I was getting to know the people. And when you're in the saddle of a bike, uh, an 80 pound, 90 pound mountain bike riding through towns from coast to coast and up and down each coast, people are very approachable. They're not intimidated at all by you. You can talk to anybody about anything. And I asked everybody what their career was and what they did and how they did it. And it was just fantastic. That was probably the most interesting career I've had that nine months in the saddle. So how long did you take that sabbatical for? How long was that? 
it, it was, it was, uh, I decided to do it while on a fun trip with some friends. We were skiing out West for a week. And then we immediately followed that with 10 weeks of scuba diving in Hawaii. And at the end of that trip, that was so inspiring to me as, uh, as an innovator, I realized I needed to really do something, a deep dive like that more, uh, intentionally. And so I decided that one year from that date, the last day of my trip, that one year from that date, I would be in the saddle of a bicycle uh, in Florida, heading north towards uh, Nova Scotia. And that's exactly what I did. And then how long were you on this bike trip? How long did this bike trip last? Nine months. Nine I months. Guess the, that's uh, that's the uh, ironically a pregnancy, right? So <laughs> I didn't I didn't design that intentionally. <laughs> Well, this has actually been a topic, albeit you and I did not talk about this before the show started, but this has been a topic. One of the things I preach is, is sometimes you almost need to take that break to do what I refer to as a trend safari. You know, mm -hmm. go out and talk to people, find out what's really going on out there versus just in your little cube, your little building, your the friends you you hang out with. Go hang out with people or, and in parts of the world that you, you just have never had any experience with. It, it broadened and strengthened my personal point of view, and it gave me uh, the authority to speak on behalf of stakeholders that maybe not everybody else had the authority. I was basically, you know, you, you say, oh, you ride a bike for nine months by yourself. You're, you're in a cave. You're alone. I was never <laughs> alone. I was riding with guys and gals from Germany, Australia, New Zealand, France, America. We talked to some people from Alaska that I spent a lot of time with. We talked all day. These were really entrepreneurial, super intelligent. I had, I was the only one with a bachelor degree. Everybody else had a master's degrees and, and beyond that. And so couple that with, you know, meeting people in every single town and, you know, talking to loggers in Northern Washington, right at the moment of the spotted owl controversy Oh wow! in a breakfast, in a breakfast place. I wasn't sure if I was going to be uh, never seen again. Um, and I had a really, uh, a little bit tense, but a really thoughtful conversation with these uh, men. They were all men who do an incredibly dangerous job, uh, super physical. They're, they're just doing their job. They're doing what brings bacon home to their families and so forth. And it was just, it was so eye opening. It was so healthy. Well, you know something, you're the second person that I know that I've, I, and this just has is an accidental product of a conversation. One of the CTOs for one of the major technology companies in Canada every year takes, I don't know, like four to six weeks on his motorcycle by himself. He's gone from Calgary up to the absolute end of the furthest road you can go north. Wow. And that was two years ago. Last year, he went out to the furthest island in Alaska from Calgary all the way out to the furthest island. But it's the exact same thing, stopping and having conversations. Now he's, a, the, he's the, the CTO for one of the mo major technology companies in Canada. And, uh, and that's his way of saying, you know something, I, my staff tells me one thing, but these are my customers. Mm -hmm. I need to be out there and really understanding and empathize with them, what they're, what's going on in their life and what is it that I can do as far as innovating new things, new products, new services, new ideas, working with my clients to actually help do that, how do I really understand what it is they're doing? Yeah, I call that fearless curiosity. And my kids, I have teenage daughters, um, they're sort of amused on a good day. And on a bad day, they're mortified by how I uh, just, I mean, I'm just talking to people at restaurants and you know, sporting <laughs> events and concerts and stuff, but I be, and I'm not intentionally interviewing them or anything like that, but I find every single person I meet to be interesting in several ways and the things that they do and how they do it. I'm genuinely curious about. And, uh, when those conversations end, I, I look over to my daughters and they're set half the time rolling their eyes, but you know what? They're there and they're engaged in it. Uh, not necessarily, you know, firsthand, but secondhand. And I think they actually in, enjoy it. And that's a designer's, I'm not an artist, I'm a designer and, and, you know, I'm designing for stakeholders and I need to know what nurses think about things. And I need to know what hospital maintenance people think and what doctors think and what the purchasing group thinks so that we can do a great job for them. Yeah. So we have to you, you fundamentally have to like people 
and want to solve all their problems as best you can. Yeah, it's interesting because I've told the story many a time. When I was CTO at HP, I would spend most Saturdays either in a Best Buy or Circuit City when Circuit City was still around, watching right. customers buy and select. And if a customer chose not one of our products, but somebody else's product, I'd interview them. So this yeah. is great. So when we come back, we're going to take a quick step away here for a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to pick up the conversation on taking this input and how do you really put that human-centric design uh, model in place. This is important for your innovation success, so don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this quick commercial break. You're listening to Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. BizTalk Radio. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Before we hop back into the segment of the show, I need to do a quick shout out to one of our longtime sponsors, which is Zoom. Zoom provides the video collaboration technology that we've been using here in the studio ever since we went on to radio over two years ago. But it's also a tool that I use every day where I'm a CEO. It's the only way that I can stay connected to my, my customers or members, my, uh, my staff, the vendor community that we have to engage with from around the world. I'm on a Zoom call every day, probably three or four different calls a day. And it's the tool that I've become most dependent on. If you haven't tried it, check it out. It's what I've said many times on this show is, it's the first video collaboration technology that doesn't suck. So check it out. We've worked out an arrangement with Zoom to get you a free account, so just go to killerinnovations.com slash Zoom. That free account will allow you to collaborate with up to 50 five zero people. That's right, 50 people you can collaborate with. And check it out, if you're not already using it, trust me, you will love it. So let's continue on on our conversation with uh, Gordon Stannis from uh, Twistthink. So Gordon, we were talking right at the end really about both of our uh, backgrounds in you know, wanting to have that direct engagement with uh, clients uh, to really understand. Um, so how did that, you, know, you, you did kind of the bike thing, you, you've had the career, but you've kind of built up this philosophy which Twistthink has around uh, the, the role of human-centric design. So why don't you talk a little bit about uh, that philosophy and how that all came about for you. So, uh, you know, people who are trained in industrial design don't realize it or, or didn't realize it 20 years ago, but they were being trained in human-centered design and they were being trained in design thinking. It's just those acronyms hadn't been fully codified, the tools and methods hadn't been uh, properly documented and so forth. So the, the only thing that we've done differently, I'd say in the last five years, is we have uh, completely embraced the industry standards for methods and uh, tools. And um, we've gone the step further. We've trained every single member of our staff. So mechanical engineers, uh, electronic engineers, uh, marketing people, we've trained them on, you know, why, why the, what is this thing? Why does it deserve to exist? How does it work? And we're not expecting to cut everybody loose on every single tool and method, but there are some that uh, we lean on pretty hard. And I'm really proud to say that a large percentage of our staff can lead uh, workshops. They can lead the HCD process. And at minimum, they know exactly where they are and they know where to go next, kind of like the old mall map. You know, we all mm -hmm. walk up to these big looming maps in the center of a mall and we decide are we going to go talk to the information person or am i going to look at this big billboard and find my orange triangle uh hcd as a as a scaffolding and a and a process map is really useful just for that it gives the cross-functional team the uh, same vocabulary the same tools and the same mall map and that's incredibly beneficial so for those of our listeners who may not know what 
you know, they, they probably have heard, you know, uh, some of the, the terminology. Uh, give us a couple of minutes of how you define HCD. Um, okay. So, so oftentimes we're, we're working with a group of people, for instance, teachers. Uh, we're, we're helping to redesign a school. We do a pro bono project every single year. Right now we're doing a, a public school uh, redesign. It's a significant redesign. So traditionally how that happens is uh, principals and superintendents decide what to do. They call an architect. The architect creates plans. And then you hold those plans up in front of um, the community and you say, please vote for these plans in the form of a millage so that we can do these great things for our kids. That's what happens 99 times out of 100, okay? Uh, I'm sitting on the board of this, uh, this local school and I said, that seems crazy. <laughs> Why would we want to be professional salespeople in the 11th hour when we're all nervous and we get one shot at this? Wouldn't it make sense to interview our stakeholders like students, like parents, like faculty, like leadership of the school, like the other two thirds of the people who I haven't mentioned yet, and they pay taxes. Those are community members that don't have kids in school and they may not have been in the school for 10 or 20 or 30 years. And they can make or break this campaign. So we crafted uh, a workshop experience. We had uh, over 160 people ranging from uh, fourth graders to octogenarians, all in separate groups. I asked them for, uh, uh, very similar questions, you know, we have a database and it's not, it's not a quantitative database, but it's a rich qualitative database. And we use that to create guiding principles to direct our architects. And they're doing this right now, frankly. And in a matter of a couple of months, we'll be holding up drawings back to the community. And we're going to be able to say, this is what you said you valued this is what you said you wanted to support and you want for your kids and your community and so forth. And, and here it is. And we hope you love it and we hope you support it. That's a way better way. It's a way better strategy than the prior. Yes. Well, versus the, you know, the old block cube problem, right? You know, every, everything's a cube. You just slap it down on a piece of paper and connect the cubes. Oh. And, that, and, that's, and that's the extent of design. Yeah, we call when I'm when I'm uh, addressing a group of people. I mean, just imagine addressing fourth graders. This was what was so great about this project is the variety of stakeholders. So we're talking to fourth graders and we're talking to 80 year old men and women in the community. And the easy way to connect with them and make them understand what we're doing and why we're doing it this way is we say we call this an anti arrogance process. Okay. You've all, we've all heard that term high horse, you know, oh, he's, he or she is up on their high horse and and they think that they know better than we do. Well, think about that as a metaphor. If you're standing among thousands of people and you're sitting on a horse, you do have an elevated perspective. And you can trick yourself into thinking that your, your perspective is superior to everybody else's perspective. When in fact, all you've done is removed yourself from eye contact, from a rich collaborative posture with those stakeholders. You're fooling yourself thinking yep. that you can look at thousands of people and understand them. You can't, you have to get off the horse and you have to move through them and walk through them and engage with them and collaborate with them. And that's what HCD does. Yep. And when we tell people that story, they get it. Well, it is. I mean, everybody tends, tends to defer, right? It's, it's interesting because my original major was architecture, right? But I don't classify myself as a designer, right? I, you know, everyone wants to be the new Frank Lloyd Wright when it comes to being an architect. I grew up in Chicago, by the way, so. <laughs> have a little affinity for uh, for FLW, but um, you know you quickly realize that though it is the variety of perspectives that come to the table that actually has some of the biggest impact. We're going to take another quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to pick up this part of the conversation on human-centered design to talk a little bit more about how that plays out and how that plays out in innovation. So you're not going to want to go anywhere. Stay right there. We're going to be right back after this quick short commercial break you're listening to Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. BizTalk Radio.
This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Before we hop back, I have a shout out for one of our other sponsors, HP. Now, for those of you longtime listeners, you're probably going, hold on, Phil, you used to be the CTO there. And yes, you'd be true. I retired at the end of 2011 as the Chief Technology Officer at HP, and I'm still a big fan of the company and the products and the technologies. HP's approached, and they have uh, picked up a financial support sponsorship. So they provide us with both equipment and uh, sponsorship fees. Now, if also, if you're a longtime listener, you know that 100% of my author royalties and anything left over from producing the show and all that all go to one of two charities, Hacking Autism, or Pioneer Education Africa. Hacking Autism, working with those on the autism spectrum who have an 81% unemployment rate. Pioneer Education Africa, we're creating an innovation, creativity uh, classroom curriculum. We're testing it in Africa, because it's really hard to test it in the United States, to help the youth of, that are coming into the school systems to be competitive in what I refer to as the creative economy that we are moving into. So I wanna thank HP. Uh, for their support, both for the equipment for the studio, but also for the support for the nonprofit work uh, that we do here at uh, Killer Innovations. So check it out. You can go over to killerinnovations.com slash HP. You can see the gear that they're putting into the studio, some great stuff. Or you can just hop over to hp.com, check out the latest and greatest. You want to check out that new EliteBook 360 laptop. It's the one I carry. I love it. It goes everywhere with me. In fact, it's right here in the studio. We run a lot of my uh, all my day-to-day -day stuff on it. You want to check it out. So check out HP, hp.com. Thanks. So, so let's pick up our conversation. Gordon, we were, we were coming out the end. We were just describing, you know, the whole concept behind human-centered design. But, you know, you've been a, a designer for quite some time, and you're at a company like Herman Miller, and you decide to leave Herman Miller to start your start twist thing. Why? Why would, you know, when you think, when I think of design, I think of Herman Miller is like one of the, the big, you know, inspirational companies that are out there. So what was it that you were, you wanted to accomplish by starting twist thing? Um, first of all, I, I have a lot of admiration for Herman Miller. Um, I did decades before I worked there. My uh, sister had their uh, Herman Miller, famous Herman Miller picnic posters hanging in her studio. So I was always wondering, who is this amazing company that's so <laughs> forward thinking and collaborates with these brilliant men and women uh, to create these uh, beautiful sculptural functional objects. So working there for four years was a real treat. But I also realized while there that um, I really love technology. I, I used to work on Nokia phones when they were the king of the hill and everything was brand new and we we're making it up as we went. And there's a funny story when uh, personal phones were pretty new. This is not long after bag phones debuted. So when handheld personal phones like the 101 and, and the uh, 232, which I worked on, um, we used to do, everybody wanted to say they were the smallest. Well, the best way to say you're smallest is to do a water displacement test. So here is an industrial designer uh, gathering up all the printed circuit boards and displays and popple switches and antenna and so and chips and uh, hot gluing them together and then doing a water displacement test of just the components themselves to see where my starting point was and then shrink evac forming ABS plastic around them to see what my next starting point was with a minimal wall thickness and then smearing automotive Chavant clay into strategic areas to soften the overall feel of these songs we were we were inventing processes that sound absurd right now but we were doing and that's the that's really really fun to be on the cutting edge of technology and trying to find a new way to do something in the rearview mirror it looks like a lascaux cave painting but <laughs> in the moment it is thrilling uh, exciting and it works so at Herman Miller, they're not a technology they weren't a technology company 15 years ago they actually are now we're, we've helped them. Uh, we just wrapped up a two-year project with them, and they've launched some pretty compelling new technologies. So we're yep. we're proud to uh, have had a, a hand in that. Uh, but 
I and a colleague, were, he was working at Automotive Tier 1. I was working at Herman Miller. We collaborated for a year and pulled the trigger and decided to try something new. And the new was get some world-class industrial designers in a room with some world-class technology designers. And we know that those usually are at opposite ends of the corporate campus. They speak totally different languages. They don't naturally empathize with each other. They don't understand each other. And we jammed them together. I mean, that was our first human-centered design uh, project right there, was <laughs> creating a culture in which we didn't just survive under the same roof, but we would thrive. And I love working with people who are way smarter about different things than me. Uh, nothing's more depressing than having a carbon copy of yourself sitting next to you, echoing what you're saying. Right. That's a waste of human capital. Right? Exactly. So what were some of the lessons you ran into? Because you're talking about you, you basically you becoming your own first client on trying to drive org organizational design around doing human-centric design just within your own staff. And right. a lot of organizations are dealing with this now. If they, they get into design thinking or they think you know, human-centered design is important, they got to deal with organizational issues today to make that happen. Yep. And we're lucky we have a head start. We have a 16-year head start on that process. And it's not rocket science. Um, first of all, we don't have departments. We never have. Um, and we move everyone's seat um, and I'm the guy who takes the hit for deciding who sits next to whom every six months, but we move everybody's chair every six months. Everybody gets the same desk, the same chair, the same co computer, essentially, and uh, we do not allow tap roots and uh, alliances. You know, if you watch any of the Survivor yes. uh, reality show, we don't allow alliances to form. It's just not healthy. Uh, we want to stay focused on the best idea wins, not the best group or the best this or, or that. So uh, we also do uh, a lot of uh, events for our teams and with their families and so forth. And, you know, you just put people in a room and their guard drops and they get to know each other and they realize there's no boogeyman. Yeah. Uh, we're all doing our best to do a great job and we want to be excellent together as a team. Yep. So the whole idea of team is uh Echo daily in our space in subtle ways and overt ways. Um, we have uh, mountain bike rides every three weeks where the entire team, as much people as we can get together, we go ride. Or we had, we're blessed with terrific mountain bike trails in the area. And you know what? Skinning your knee and flying over the handlebars and carrying somebody out of the woods. And that helps form team bonds and, and uh, adds the necessary dimension to the day job. So Twist Things had a lot of variety of clients. Talk, talk us through some of the work that uh, the firm has done. Yeah, we, I, I oftentimes joke, there's an easier way to make a buck than the way <laughs> we do it. Um, we work in, I, I was laughingly say, said some, to someone recently, they said, what, have you, what markets do you work in? I said, it's easier to tell you the markets we don't work in. So to date, we have not designed a church and we haven't designed a prison. Those are the only two markets I can think of that we haven't had some contribution <laughs> toward. <laughs> but you're, you've got everything, though, from consumer goods projects to all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and, and as you, I'm sure you can understand, the, 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 our value is the fact that we have points of view in all these different markets and we're able to cross pollinate and a, uh, a, a, a new technology in one field might be not so new in another industry and, and vice versa. And we can shine some bright lights. We never divulge trade secrets, obviously. We don't point to IP. We generate a lot of IP. We have hundreds of patents as a firm. Um, but you know what? For instance, right now we're working with two great companies, Bissell, based in western Michigan, vacuum cleaners, and Millican, based uh, down south in, in Carolinas. And, and we're working on different projects, totally different projects for both of them, but we can't help but think that there are really compelling synergies should these two companies come together, share the problems they're trying to solve, and realize, hey, your product works on my product, and my product affects your product, and what if? Right. Exactly. We've done that. We've done that for a decade. We've exactly. brought 
Well, I think you bring up a good um, point, which is which, together. which is that cross pollination. When you've got enough experiences from enough uh, efforts and activities, we're going to need to just take step out and take the another quick commercial break. When we come back, Gordon. What I'd like for you to do is just share one or two pieces of advice for organizations that really are thinking about jumping in to human-centered design. What would be kind of things that you would advise them just stump jumping in? So we come back from commercial break. Uh, Gordon's going to give us some take-home advice, things that you can apply to your organization and your activities. And we'll be right back. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. BizTalk Radio. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back. Let's pick up our conversation with Gordon Stannis of uh, TwistThink. Now, Gordon, as we're going into the commercial break, I gave you the challenge of coming up with one or two pieces of advice you would give to an organization that hasn't really got uh, human-centered design activities within their maybe R&D organization or their innovation organization, what would be the one or two pieces of advice you would give to an organization that's thinking about really embracing this design thinking, human-centered design? Okay. Um, three things. Create, create a, uh, a common language, and I know it sounds, it's very easy to say and it's difficult to do, we have done it with organizations. We know how to do it, and we know it pays enormous dividends. So you create a process, and you train people with a common language, and you and you set them free, and they can actually do something that is so difficult for human beings. They can communicate effectively. Okay. Cross-functional teams can communicate effectively. That's huge. Uh, number two is visualize. Um, it's incredible how many people, how many organizations – think that creating uh, Visio diagrams and Excel spreadsheets and maybe even a Microsoft project plan is a rich form of communication between uh, bipeds with different perspectives. It is not. When I say communicate, I mean visual, three-dimensional, two-dimensional, shaded, illustrated ideas that the average person, think pedestrian, that the average person can look at and understand and get those on the wall and keep them on the wall and refresh that wall frequently. Um, and I'm not talking about a little three foot section of wall. I'm talking about a hundred foot section of wall. That's eight feet tall. Um, those two things, you do those two things. It will have transformative power for your organization. And we're shocked and dismayed, frankly, that, uh, you know, 40 years into the, uh, everyone understanding what industrial design is and so forth, that those are still viewed as uh, new ideas. And then the, the third thing, there's this uh, hierarchy to get to innovation. Um, one of my frustrations being a designer for 30 years is hearing that buzzword thrown around so <laughs> strategically by one person and not strategically by another person. And it, that, that word is like an old football that just gets kicked through the parking lot and skinned up and beat up so here's here's something to consider innovation is an outcome okay there are some steps and there are skills associated with the steps that allow any person or group or organization to get to the innovation summit so let me use i just finished up a climbing trip so bear with me as i use this <laughs> as a metaphor so the parking lot for innovation uh, where you take your gear out and you're loading it up in your pack and you're sorting it and you're making sure you have everything. The parking lot's curiosity, okay? Uh, you can't innovate if you're not genuinely curious. If you just want to make money, that's not a great starting point for innovation, okay? Uh, making money is a byproduct of innovation. <laughs> so curiosity is essential. you got to get people around the table that care and they're really genuinely, naturally curious. The second step is imagination. So you have to place a value and reward curiosity. You have to reward imagination. And then there's this thing that 
is similar to imagination, but in my world, it's actually very, very different, and it's called creativity. Um, I know very creative people who are not imaginative, and conversely, I know very imaginative people that, that can't create. They don't know how to take an initial idea and form it and shape it and morph it and test it, prototype it in any form to get to an innovation. So this, again, parking lot is curiosity, base camp is imagination, mid camp is creativity, and the fleeting summit, you get up there, you take some great photos, and you hustle back down before the storm rolls in so that you can do it all over again. That summit is innovation itself. That's that's a metaphor I came up with about six months ago, and I've been shopping it around our office. It's been gaining some pretty good traction. Um, we even slapped it on our beehive out on our patio. We've got a four-layer beehive, and we layered it in, in four ways. And we're just <laughs> doing whatever we can do to reinforce these primitive, basic messages. But until people understand uh, a definition, they can't promote it. And, and, and until it's rewarded, until people are rewarded for each step, each rung on that ladder, um, they, don't do they won't it. get done. Yeah, they won't do it. So, Gordon, if people want to keep track of what you're up to and what you're doing, what's the best place to uh, find you? Um, our website is, is easy to find, uh, uh, twistthink.com. There's one overlapping T in the middle uh, in Twistthink. Um, and we're all, uh, you know, being transparent. A year ago, we kind of lived in uh, our little cave and we just did our work for our clients. And, you know, oftentimes they wouldn't even, if they went out and won an international design award, they didn't even want us mentioned because they they wanted to win that award on their own as a point of pride. And, you know, we were kind of quietly serving them in, in, in the background. So we were maybe guilty of being overly humble and maybe even a little naive in the last year. Uh, we have challenged our entire staff to do more things like I'm doing today. Uh, if you're going to a conference, that's great. We'll, we'll pay for you to go to New York City for a week and go to that uh, great conference. Uh, which breakout session are you going to speak at? Yeah. That's become the, the mantra. If you're going, you're, you're not just, uh, it's not a spectator sport. You're in it. Yeah, right? you, have to, you have to get out there and tell the story. And I was out on your site, and it is phenomenal as far as being able to look at your portfolio of, uh, of projects. So Gordon, I want to thank Thanks. you. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy uh, Sunday to uh, come and uh, spend your day off to, with us here at Kill Innovations. I greatly appreciate it. And I want to stay in touch. You guys are doing some, some really impressive stuff and it uh, uh, can uh, be a great source of inspiration for a lot of people. So congratulations. And again, thank you for being on the show. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. So as we wrap up the show, then let's, uh, I've got a couple of quick announcements here. One is, is that we've got the um, two events coming up Tuesday, September 26th in New York City and Thursday, September 29th in Washington, D.C. I'm hosting breakfast. If you want to come, check it out. I think New York's about sold out. They've only got maybe one or two seats left. The way to register is to go over to the innovators.network slash NYC, or you go over to the innovators.network slash DC for the Washington DC one. So check those out, meet up, let's have a conversation, meet other innovators. And so with that, we're gonna wrap up this week's show. Appreciate you taking the time out of this, out of your Sunday to be with us. And we'll talk to you next week. Do not let the innovation antibodies get you down. Go change the world. The opinions you hear on Biz Talk Radio are those of the hosts, callers, and guests, and do not necessarily reflect those of this station, Biz Talk Radio, its management, or advertisers. The information on Biz Talk Radio does not constitute a recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or service. If you have any questions about Biz Talk Radio, contact us at 817-274-1609 or at biztalkradio.com. Biz Talk Radio. 